Welcome to the Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. I'm Susan Brender, and this is the Susan Brender Show. Today, I am so pleased that we have Dr. Brody, and his name is Mark Brody, uh, MD, who is nationally recognized as an expert in both Alzheimer's disease and stroke, as well as the principal investigator in numerous clinical trials seeking to prevent and treat Alzheimer's. He's the author of a phenomenal book called Brain Matters Research, which gives substance and hope to people who have to deal with this issue. So with that said, I would like to welcome to my show, Dr. Mark Brody. Thanks, Susan. Well, my pleasure, Mark. You know, when you when I saw your book, Brain Matters, I said, this is a book that everybody has to read because let, let me just tell the audience a little bit about you. Brain Matters Research, which is a nationally recognized center of excellence focused on mild cognitive impairment, age-related cognitive de- decline in Alzheimer's disease, and you you offer the most comprehensive current and ethical research along with medical direction and support for you and your primary care physician and you being the people in our audience. And with that said, let's talk a little bit about, if you would, um, Dr. Bodie, a little bit uh, about the process. So take me through the process, which means somebody comes into your office and they're with their spouse or their friend or somebody, and they say, we'd like to discuss this with you because something's wrong. Something is not right. My whatever, my my husband or my wife is dealing with some kind of decline and I can't figure it out. Go take us through the process of what happens when they walk into your door. Right. So basically what we want to understand is From the person's point of view, do they think they're having any issues with either their memory or the clarity of their – and sometimes people aren't aware that they are. And then uh, we also ask, you know, the wife or the daughter that comes with them to give us their perspective. And we preface it by saying, I like to hear from you who might not agree with each other, but uh, for the next few minutes, I'm going to be Perry Mason. Both of you are going to be on the witness stand. And let's, let's try to figure out what's going on. And right. then we kind of go back. And if there is a memory trouble, we try to figure out when did it start? Is it changing? And um, understand uh, what other things might be going on around that. Do people have trouble with finding words? Are they having change in their mood? Are they having change with their ability to do calculations or directions? Are they having trouble with uh, managing their finances? Is there any issues with driving? And then we want to understand, is there what kind of medications they're on? And Mm -hmm. I'm happy to tell you that when people may come in, 10 to 20% of of the time, we find something that's fixable. And, ah. But you've got to look. So a lot of the times when people come in, it's because there's a change in behavior. You know, right. you say, Bob, there's something wrong with Bob. He's got a short fuse. Is You know, we're, we all know something's not right or not sure what it is. And that's where we right. start. Now, um, many people come into you, I'm sure, and they, they just have no clue as to what's going on. They, they know there's an issue. And you will describe uh, to them what the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's is, because there is something very different about the two. And so would you tell our audience a little bit about what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Right. So dementia is the category, the umbrella. And underneath that, far and away, the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's type dementia. About 70 to 75 percent of dementias are Alzheimer's type dementia. So Dementia means that you have trouble with your short-term memory and it getting worse over time, and you have trouble with at least two of the other cognitive spheres, which include language, so that's comprehension, expression, 
uh, ability to see things in time and space, visual spatial abilities, look at a map, follow directions, um, arithmetic, judgment, mm. intellect, mood. So you have to have two of those and some short-term memory problems, and you're having trouble doing all the things that you normally did, and that whole mishmash is getting worse over time. That dementia is a particular and most common type of dementia. I see. Now, let's talk a little bit about the the spouse or the friend or the daughter or whomever and the effects of this kind of thing on them. I'm sure right. you've seen dozens and dozens of people come in your office and you've seen them in different states of mind. Let's talk about the psychological impact that it has both on the person who's been diagnosed and also on, on the person who takes care of them. Right. So here's uh, an unfortunate fact that people who have Alzheimer's in particular, the caregivers, uh, as the disease progresses, 50% of the caregivers die before the patients. It's that stressful. Wow. So that's huge. That's absolutely huge. Right. So this is when you drop a pebble in this pond, there's a big ripple effect. And the first ripple comes with the immediate family, and it's usually the yeah. spouse. And but it impacts the whole family. So as yeah. far as the the person and themselves, sometimes they are unaware of the problems, and sometimes uh, quite resentful, and they're in denial. But a lot of people say, "Yeah, I think maybe I do have a little trouble," and they're aware of it. And some people who are aware of it can get very uh, dejected, frustrated, they don't know what's going on, frightened. Everybody's different. But yeah. the point is where we're at now is making a diagnosis early when there's a puff of smoke is where we have the best chance of really making a dent. And yeah. Yeah. right now, one of the most exciting things is we're doing actually prevention trials where people uh, – don't have any memory problems or clarity of thinking problems, and we decide we can make a designation that they're at risk, either from a family or they have a gene, and then we can do a scan of the brain and we can see the abnormal proteins building up 10 to 15 years before anybody gets a symptom, and the holy grail would be, and we could treat them and they'll never know what they miss. So. We're, we're mm. there now. Now, you just mentioned proteins. Um, I think this is important for our audience to understand, too. Um, so explain to us from a medical point of view how the brain looks when it is starting um, like early onset of dementia or Alzheimer's. What do, we see, what do you see in the brain that indicates to you that there's an issue. Right. So when we look at people's brains who have Alzheimer's, either very early or as the disease progresses later, we see that the brain starts to shrink. And over time, the actual brain cells and the connections are starting to melt away. And so we see that there are two abnormal proteins that are toxic to the brain cells, and one is called amyloid, beta amyloid, and the other one is called tau, T-A-U. And this is the hallmark of Alzheimer's. This is what we see in everybody who has the disease. And these things are building up for at least 10 to 15 years before people get symptoms. And as they're building up, and these proteins are toxic to the brain, the actual connections are starting to melt away. Dementias, and Alzheimer's in particular, are memory diseases. They are not. They, this hmm. is organ failure. They start off wow. with memory problems, but the whole brain starts to degenerate. And this is why this is such a critical um, disease for us because everybody right now who has the disease gets worse and everybody dies. There are no exceptions. Yeah, yeah. Which, which brings up the whole point. If you know and you are able to study, which is in such an incredible advance in medicine, if you're able to study the brain clinically and you see the proteins and the things that are blocking uh, the arteries in the brain, which are you know, indicative of the fact that there is a problem going on, why isn't it possible to do something about it You know, at the point where they don't die? There's only four medications out there that are approved by the FDA. And they're symptomatic treatment. 
they're band-aids. They don't do anything to the, these abnormal toxic proteins. And the studies that we've done, we haven't hit a winner to the point where we can put this in remission. This, this is like slowly progressive brain cancer, and we're trying to put people in remission. And ideally, if we could, we could identify the disease before people had symptoms, we could stop it in its tracks before people got symptoms. But we, that's why we're desperately doing this research to find a, a treatment that really stops the disease cold or really slows it down. And that's what we're doing. And everybody um, from big pharma to medium and small biotechs to startups, everybody's looking for a, a breakthrough treatment. Dr. Brody, you know, it's very interesting to me that people complain all the time about pharmaceutical companies. They say, oh, they take advantage, huge advantage and of people in terms of putting together all kinds of pharmaceuticals at exorbitant prices. And, you know, if we don't want this to happen. It, it's wrong for the pharmaceutical companies. Well, how would you address something like that when it comes to the ho whole notion of research having to be done on a disease which hasn't been yet, as we speak, um, eradicated? Well, I mean, that's the point. Pharmaceutical companies uh, sometimes get a bad rap. But the, the truth is we're all living better pharmacologically between breakthroughs for diabetes and cancer and heart disease. We're living longer. We're living better. But it takes investment to find breakthrough medicines. And uh, companies, on average, for uh, a neurologic disease, the pharmaceutical companies have to spend about $2.2 .2 billion to get a drug approved. Wow. So at some point, they have to make a profit. And so they're for-profit companies, and I don't begrudge them that, especially when there's uh, a no treatment, no effective treatment for Alzheimer's. So whoever wins and there's a breakthrough treatment, it'll be worth every penny and um, because there's – People spend 40% of this disease in the moderate to severe category. And as you know, since there's a family history in your family, this is a disease without dignity. It's a terrible way to pass. And yes. so I think I'm very supportive of the pharmaceutical industry wanting to come up and working diligently to come up with a drug, a treat that really works. I've been at this for uh, the past 15 years, and we getting near a breakthrough, but we haven't had one. And so they, we've spent, uh, pharmaceutical companies have spent over $30 billion trying to get a breakthrough drug, and mm -hmm. we still haven't got one, but they don't stop. So this wow. is how they make a living, and this will be a breakthrough. And hopefully, I can tell you, I know, far, you, you know, the Alzheimer's Association says the first Alzheimer survivor is already walking around. So we wow. need, we don't have a choice. This is the silver tsunami. This will bankrupt us, both uh, from a financial and spiritual point of view, unless we find effective drugs. We don't have a choice. I, I hear you. Now, let's talk a little bit also about compassionate care, because I'm, I've spoken to people, and I know what it was like for me with my parents. Um, you know, it's, it's such a difficult thing uh, for the families and the support group that takes care of the person who has this disease. And there must be something that you can d talk to them about and d talk in terms of how they should handle things like this, because the confusion, the sadness, the hopelessness really has to have a huge impact on the family and on the friend. Dr. Brody, all kinds of people who walk through the doors of your office who say, I've never encountered something like this. It's so disturbing and it is causing my family so much grief. And also the friends who care so much about it give up on being with a person who has Alzheimer's. So there must be a something that you can tell them or advise them on which would 
make life a little bit easier for them because needless to say, there's a lot of hopelessness and a lot of a lot of problems associated with what happens when a loved one is is unfortunately struck with this this problem. Well, really, we're treating the patient and the family at the same time. So the the way we approach uh, the patient and their family has to be based on uh, the individuals uh, because people have different personalities. People present differently. Sometimes people are socially withdrawn. Sometimes they're belligerent. Sometimes there's a very supportive uh, family structure. And sometimes there's just one caregiver and they are uh, in a desperate situation and need support both emotionally and with um, other facilities, you know, where we have caregivers come in or nursing or daycare programs or respite and decide, you know, when it's too much before caregivers burn out and they're in a crisis to talk about um, going in for placement, like in an assisted living or eventually a dementia unit or even, unfortunately, getting to the point where uh, respite care. So, Really, we need to get to know the family and then figure out what can we do for that particular situation. I hear you. Now, uh, let me just list a number of things that you offer in your clinic because I think it's important for people to hear what is necessary when they are unfortunately um, given a, a very negative um, diagnosis about Alzheimer's and dementia. And here's what it says. First of all, you're a nationally recognized center of excellence and you're dedicated to cognitive health. I think that is wonderful. You give comprehensive evaluations, second opinions, last advances in uh, prevention, diagnostics and treatment through clinical trials, which I want to talk about for a second as well, on-site support groups and lecture series so that people can understand a little bit more about this issue, 24-7 caregiver support network, and it goes on and on. But let, let's get back to that clinical trial. When somebody goes through a clinical trial, uh, what is that all about? And what should the person who is, you know, their support system know about that? Well, we're doing um, clinical research trials, and they're pharmaceutical-sponsored clinical research trials under the uh, supervision of the FDA. So these are drugs in development. They haven't been approved yet, and they're at different stages. They can be at early stages, phase one, which is the, early, the first exposure to people with the disease, and then phase two where we've established safety, and now we're seeing is, is there any evidence that's effective. And then finally, stage three, where we're trying to prove that it really works, and it's the last step before we go to the FDA to get approval so the drug can be sold and CVS and Walgreens and Walmart and so on. And these are, as the uh, studies expand into later phase trials, they're now international trials. And phase one is sometimes people sleep over for uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, so that we can really uh, assess uh, safety of the drug. And to all the studies in the United States under the FDA are double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. And in English, it means begin with, you may or may not get the real drug. You may get a placebo, but whatever medication you're on, you will stay on. And the studies that are further along, once you've been through the double-blind portion where you don't know what you're getting and I don't know what I'm giving you, then everybody gets the drug. I know it, they know it. And for research, there is no cost. Now, the pharmaceutical companies want to prove they have a drug that works, and then, mm -hmm. of course, they'll want to make a profit, and, and I don't begrudge them that because it will truly be a breakthrough. The, that's the basic process, and in the, in the midst of doing that, there are consent forms that explain what are the risks, what are the benefits, what's involved, how often people have to come, and people, if they have capacity, can decide, yes, I'd like to try this, or if further along, the caregiver can say, well, Bob doesn't understand all the details, but I, I will 
uh, sign consent for them as long as they're willing to participate. And then we get you started. Know, mm-hmm. And, you know, Dr. Brody, it's really mind-boggling to me because look at the advances that we've made in technology. I mean, it's it's huge. In fact, I, I'll tell you something that is very interesting to me. I'm actually watching um, a program that talks about the medical treatments that were given in the 1700s and 1800s. And there was nothing. There was practically nothing. You know, all kinds of placebos were given to them. And of course, people died at a very early age. And today, I mean, we have this technology that is so advanced and Maybe in the next 50 years, it's going to be, you know, if we're here, I mean, we'd be shocked to see what's going to happen. But why is it that technology has advanced so much and they're doing some kind of stem cell research all over the place and we haven't gotten a cure for Alzheimer's? It's mind boggling well, to me. Well, let's, let's put it this way. The brain is the most complicated uh, organ um, that's known. So if you take a supercomputer, it doesn't come close to the sophistication of the brain. And although we know how the heart works and the kidney works and the liver works and we can do transplants and we have artificial hearts and so on, that's not the case with the brain. It's the only organ that if it's not working, you can be declared clinically dead. We just don't know enough about uh, the mechanism of the disease, how the brain works, it's so sophisticated uh, that we could that there's no easy fix. It's it's going to take some time. Now, as a stroke specialist, it took. I, I worked on stroke treatments for uh, 17 years before we had a major breakthrough. So, in medical research of the brain, um, a couple decades is not a long time. Remember, um, everything that we're calling Alzheimer's is Uh, really a a syndrome. Underneath that syndrome, even that we're calling Alzheimer's, there's at least four or five distinct diseases that uh, have different mechanisms that we can't really identify yet. And so the treatments are going to have to be tailored to those mechanisms. And it's long research. This is a progressive disease. So some of these studies take years to come up with uh, an answer as to whether the drug's working or not. And it has to be effective enough for uh, insurance companies and Medicare to pay for. It can't work just a little bit. It has to, it has to be significantly uh, effective and make an impact. And we've had some things that work a little bit for a little while, but we really haven't come up with a, a, a real breakthrough yet. Excuse me for interrupting. What about the National Institute of Health? Where are they in this whole process? And do you have any kind of relationship with them because of all the things that you're doing so you could kind of share your research and share all of the things that you're learning? Well, the NIH, I am doing some studies that are co-sponsored by the National Institute of Health, um, and some of those are really, uh, for the most part, prevention uh, research. But the um, NIH funds uh, big re- primary bench research facilities like Scripps and Max Planck and universities. Mm-hmm. And then whatever they are coming up with that shows promise, then the pharmaceutical companies have to take it from there to do big clinical trials with people to show yeah. that the drugs are safe and they're uh, effective. And that's not something the NIH does. That's really something that industry has to translate from the lab into into human trials. And last but not least, there must be certain things that you would recommend. I see that um, in your book and certainly in, in some of the research that you've done, uh, you've indicated that diet, uh, that exercise, sleep, um, really have or contribute, if you will, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but you you can correct me. And that is that they have they do have an impact on maybe the intensity, uh, or they can slow down if you have, you know, a good um, a good amount of exercise, diet, you name it, could slow the disease down. Am I right about that, or is that just a, you know, just a placebo? No, you're, 
No, you're right. There are risk factors for getting Alzheimer's, just like there are risk factors for stroke, and it turns out that they overlap to a large degree. But the Mediterranean diet has shown evidence that it can delay onset of the disease and slow progression. Exercise, actually, uh, both aerobic exercise using some sort of weight um, will actually increase brain-derived nerve growth factor. So it, we used to say when you hit your mid-teens, early 20s, you've made all the brain cells you're going to make, and it's all downhill from there. The truth <laughs> is that even as we age, we slowly continue to make new brain cells. And so when you exercise and increase the blood flow, you stimulate uh, growth factors in the brain to actually uh, act as a fertilizer to increase the, the rate at which new brain cells are made. So it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we, we are almost at the end of the show, and I always like my audience to uh, get a message uh, that you would like to leave about – uh, the clinical trials, why it's so important to do certain things. Um, what, what would you like to tell our audience uh, in finishing up the show today? Well, I would like to quote the famous American philosopher Yogi Berra, who said, <laughs> it, never, it never happens till it does, and then it did. And so really, we're not going to come up with an answer unless people come in and participate in clinical trials. And the message is, so a lot of people don't want to come in because they don't want to know if they have Alzheimer's. And mm. two, they don't think there's anything to do about it. And that's not true. Because a lot of people have things that are masquerading as Alzheimer's, but they're too afraid to come in because they don't want to hear that word. And sure. two is we do have potentially new breakthrough treatments. But you've got to come in, and there's no cost. And we're only going to get there when people – are willing to come in and advance science. And the reality is uh, we really don't have a choice. So um, when you have a disease where everybody gets worse and everybody succumbs, that's where we want people to come in and we want to break through desperately. So that's the message. Well, I have to tell you something. I'm reading your mission, and I think that it's important for our audience to hear your mission, and that is to elevate Alzheimer's disease to the level of urgency it deserves. And it's a degenerative cancer of the brain, wow, uh, that no one survives, unfortunately. But your mission demands community involvement on all fronts, which you just described. And I think that Dr. Brody being a nationally recognized expert in both Alzheimer's disease and stroke is really a feather in your cap and people deserve to get your treatment because you know what you know and what you know is a lot. So with that said, my guest today has been Dr. Brody, uh, Mark Brody, and he is a very special doctor who has written a book called Brain Matters, the Prevention of Aging, Alzheimer's, and Stroke. And I would like everybody to know, Dr. Brody, how they get it and if they want to reach out to you, how they do that. Well, we are, you can go to brainmattersresearch.com and uh, read, you can see all the information we have and the, the book's actually online. And we do free screening, so you just need to contact us. Um, and we do have a contact number. Uh, and we have two facilities, uh, a large one in Delray, which is, and uh, a smaller site that we just opened up in the last year in Stewart, Florida. So there you if go. you go to the website or call 561-374-8400, uh, call and come in and we'll do a free screening and we can give you some information based on what, what we see. Well, you know, we have a dedication um, that we really try to attribute to our show, and that is providing education and information to our audience that can be of a lot of help to them. And you've provided that, and I thank you so much for being on my show. Thanks for having me, Susan. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sebrender at yahoo.com.